Ladies and gentlemen, greetings and welcome to Fresh Vision Church here in El Paso, Texas. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this message on Facebook or on YouTube um, or even if you're just listening to this message. Um, I sincerely just want to thank you for um, checking us out. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to share them. You can do that by going to the bottom of the YouTube video and you can leave one there or you can just leave a message on our Facebook page. We also have social media pages you can go to, Twitter, Instagram. Um, you can look us up there and leave us a message um, if you want to or a question. Also, I want to point you to our website, fvcelp.org. There you can also leave us a message, a prayer request, a praise report. You can find more information about us, a short little biography about me is on there, um, about the church, our mission statement, or what we believe and what we do as a church. So again, if you want to know more about us, please feel free to check us out there. Your financial contributions are also helpful, especially during this time. If that's something you'd like to do, you can find our PayPal information also on our website, or you can send us a check through the mail here to the, uh, to the church. And again, the address is there on the website. So um, again, I appreciate that you've taken the time to check out this message. I hope that by the time we're done here that it will have blessed you and that God has personally spoken a word to you. So with that, I'll begin with today's message. I titled this morning's message, A Wasted Life. And we're gonna be finishing off the 16th chapter of Luke's Gospel. If you heard the message last week, you remember that um, Jesus had turned the tables on the Pharisees who had scoffed at his parable. Well here, Jesus will conclude his lesson on the importance of managing temporal position, possessions, and power with the story of two lives, two deaths, and two afterlives. Jesus here will give both his disciples and the religious leaders a vivid description of the chasm that exists in the afterlife between those in paradise and those in Hades. Frankly, this story is pretty scary and it's eye-opening and I think that it has the potential to change your life if you listen carefully and heed the warnings. Because no matter how much you've accomplished or how successful you've become or will become, it's still possible to live a wasted life. So throughout this morning's passage, you'll learn that the choices of this life will determine your eternal destiny. And once death has taken place, that destiny is fixed. So as I normally do, let's open up with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for giving us this morning, this beautiful, precious morning. I want to thank you for all those that are listening and watching this message. I pray that you will bless them wherever they're at. Um, I pray that you will give them strength and comfort if they need it, Lord. And I pray that you will continue to give joy to those who are just rejoicing in you today. And may, may, that, and may that joy be passed on to others, Lord. Lord, we're looking forward to what you have to say this morning. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you have to say to us at this time. So bless this message that I'm about to present, Lord. May it go out there with power. May those who hear it be blessed, Lord. And may lives be forever changed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, and we'll be in verse 19 this week. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. And the word of God says, There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table. But instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. 
Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things just as Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here while you're in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot. Neither can those from there cross over to us. Father, he said, then I beg you to send them to my father's house, because I have five brothers, to warn them so they won't also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But he told them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Now, before I break down this passage, I want to share with you a story I read. It's a little lengthy, so bear with me, and, and you'll see how it has a lot to do with what we're going to be covering today. Dr. Maurice Rawlings, a cardiologist and professor at the, at, of medicine at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine in Chattanooga, and his co colleagues were constantly treating emergency patients, many of whom had, have had near-death experience. A study of these cases by Dr. Rawlings was reported in Omni magazine. According to the article, it is no longer unusual to hear about people who have almost died who speak of seeing a bright light, lush green meadows, rows of smiling relatives, and experiencing a deep sense of peace. However, Rawlings obtains additional information from his patients by interviewing them immediately following resuscitation while they are very much in touch with their experience. Rawlings says that nearly 50% of the 300 people that he interviewed have reported lakes of fire, devil-like figures, and other sites reflecting the darkness of hell. Rawlings says that these people later change their story because they don't want to admit where they've been, not even to their families. Just listening to these patients has changed my whole life. There's a life after death, and if I don't know where I'm going, it's safe, it's not safe to die. Rawlings was a devout atheist considered our religions, our religions hocus pocus, and death nothing more than painless extinction, extin, extinction. But something happened in 1977 that brought a dramatic change in his life. He was resuscitating a man, terrified and screaming. Each time he regained heartbeat and respiration, the patient screamed, I'm in hell. He was terrified pleaded, and pleaded with me to help him I was scared to death. Then I noticed a genuinely alarmed look in his face. He had a terrified look, worse than the expression seen in death. This patient, this patient had a grotesque grimace expressing sheer horror. His pupils were dilated and he was pers perspiring and trembling. He looked as if his hair was on end. Then still another strange thing happened, he said. Don't you understand? I'm in hell. Don't let me go back to hell. The man was serious. And it finally occurred to me that he was indeed in trouble. He was in a panic like I've never seen before. Rawlings said no one who could have heard his screams and saw the look of terror on his face could doubt for a single minute that he was actually in a place called hell. Well, when speaking about eternal matters, Jesus had to often put things in a way his listeners would clearly understand. So while the topic of wealth and poverty was still fresh on everyone's mind, he tells this story that's meant to expose the foolishness of living life without considering the eternal consequences. As we saw, Jesus began by describing the temporal conditions, the life circumstances of two men. One was an anonymous rich man 
who enjoyed living a luxurious lifestyle. He wore the most expensive clothes. I was known for feasting lavishly all day. These, te these details would have immediately set him apart from Jesus' disciples and the common Jewish citizen. But he would have been someone that the Pharisees wanted to be like. The other was a poor man named Lazarus, whose name means God is my help, whose body was covered with sores. Homeless and diseased, he spent his life laying at the rich man's gate, barely surviving by the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Well, over time, his physical condition had worsened to the point that dogs would come and lick his sores. Unlike the wealthy Pharisees, the, those listening to this story who lived in poverty and were seriously ill would have easily have related to Lazarus. Well, one day, the poor Lazarus died. And inevitably, inevitably, the rich man also died, which appears to be the only thing the two men held in common in this story. The difference, though, was what Jesus emphasized had happened after death. When Lazarus died, he was carried away by angels and positioned right at Abraham's side, the father of the Jewish faith, the best place a Jew would want to be after dying. The rich man, however, went where his master, money, took him, to Hades or hell, a place of eternal suffering and torment. Now, just to be clear, this anonymous rich man wasn't condemned to Hades because of his wealth. He was condemned because he trusted in his riches and didn't trust in the Lord. In John chapter 3, verse 18, Jesus said, Whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. The proof of his unbelief was evident by his careless disregard of Lazarus. You see, if he truly would have had the love of God in him, he wouldn't have allowed a sick and hungry man to beg outside of his front door. Now, on the other hand, it should also be clear that Lazarus wasn't saved because he was poor. He was in heaven because he had trusted the Lord for the salvation of his soul. Speaking of Jesus, Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we're told that if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. Now, in case you're wondering how this would have been possible if Jesus hadn't yet completed his mission, keep in mind what the purpose of this story is. This wasn't a story of how a person gets saved, but rather how life's choices have consequences and in the afterlife there are no second chances as it says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 people are destined to die once and after that face judgment so here's the point everyone has been given one life to live and the choices you make now will determine where you'll and ultimately end up after you die if you're living for yourself without a thought or care about eternity, then don't be surprised if one day you find yourself in the same place as this rich man. Well, the scene then completely shifts from life to the afterlife, and the circumstances of both men are now completely reversed. As the rich man's soul, or his conscious self, was suffering severe torture and pain in Hades, he can somehow see Abraham off at a distance with Lazarus at his side. Now he recognized him. He recognized Lazarus as the same guy who was always laying outside the gate of his house and who had lived his life suffering through poverty, hunger, and disease. 
Now, just as a side note, this further proves that in eternity, we'll not only recognize one another, but as we're about to see, we'll also be able to communicate with one another as well. So seeking relief from his agony, the rich man called out to Abraham for help. He even addressed him as father in order to gain some sympathy from him. He hoped that by using his status as one of his descendants, he'd be deserving of help from his distant forefather and from the God that he served. So he pleads for mercy by asking Abraham to send poor, unclean, filthy Lazarus to come to the rescue. Even though he never did it for him while they were alive. He wanted Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool his tongue so he can just alleviate a little bit of, his, of the agony that he was feeling from the, fr- from the flames of hell. Now just to give you an idea of what the pain and suffering of hell will be like, back in Luke chapter 13 verse 28 Jesus said, there will be weeping there and gnashing of the teeth. Now there's a couple things I want you to notice here. First of all, it shows that even in the afterlife, the rich man still thought he had a sense of entitlement by seeing Lazarus as a servant. And secondly, these flames refer to the ones that come from the blazing furnace mentioned in Matthew chapter 13, verse 50, and the lake of fire mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. Well, Abraham did reply back, but not in the way that the rich man hoped he would. Right away, Abraham addresses him as son, confirming that he was a physical descendant, though obviously not a spiritual, spiritual one. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, we're told who a spiritual descendant of Abraham is. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Abraham then reminded him that during his life, He lived in luxury, ease, and indulgence. While on the other hand, Lazarus had lived a life suffering of poverty and sickness. You see now the tables had turned and the inequalities of their lives on earth had flipped. Lazarus was now comforted with the comfort he had longed for all those many years. While the rich man had gone from total comfort to total agony. He then explained an eternal reality to him. Yes, he could communicate with him, but he couldn't come to him. Why? Well, let me read verse 26 again. A great chasm has been fixed between us and you, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, neither can those from there cross over to us. Now, for those who may not know what a chasm is, It's an impassable wide opening that separates two places. So to put it plainly, a vast chasm exists between heaven and hell. And no one from there can go here, and no one from here can go there. Now, there isn't a description of what it looks like, and no geographic location is given. The one thing, however, that we're absolutely clear about is this. Whatever side you're on, you'll never be able to go to the other side. The lesson here is that the choices of this life determine your eternal destination. And once death has taken place, that destiny is fixed. There's no passage from the eternal residence of the saved to that of the damned, or vice versa. Now, I've often heard people say, how can a loving God permit such a place as hell to exist, let alone send people there? But in asking that question, they're actually revealing that they don't understand either the love of God or the wickedness of sin. You see, God's love is a holy love, not a shallow sentiment. And sin is rebellion against a holy and loving God. Furthermore, God doesn't send people to hell. They send themselves there by refusing to heed His call and believe in His Son. 
Now, besides John 3.16, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 mentions this as well. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Now what's interesting too is that the faithless are named second on the list of the people who go to hell. Even before the murderers and the liars. Here's what it says in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur which is the second death. Well, returning to the story, realizing there was no longer any hope for himself, the rich man then turned his thoughts to his family that he had left behind. He again begged Abraham to send Lazarus to his five brothers to warn them against coming to the place of torment that he was in. Now, perhaps some of you have heard someone say, I'm in hell, or if I'm in hell, I'll be in good company. Well, these statements are complete and they're a deception. The rich man here never said, I'm so glad my brothers will be here with me. We'll have a blast together. No, he wanted to warn them about his fate and that hell was a place of perpetual torment and absolute loneliness. If you've ever had to go through an extremely painful moment on your own, imagine that feeling magnified a billion times. If you doubt this, look at the three characters in this story again. Two were side by side in paradise, and one was alone in Hades. Speaking to Christians about hell, C.H. Spurgeon said this, You and I can never imagine all the depths of hell. Shut out from us by a black veil of darkness, we cannot tell the, tor- we cannot tell the horrors of that dismal dungeon of lost souls. Happily, the wailings of the damned have never startled us. For a thousand tempests were but a maiden's whisper compared to one well of a damned spirit. It is not possible for us to see the tortures of those souls who dwell eternally within an anguish that knows no alleviation. These eyes would become sightless balls of darkness if they, had, if they were permitted for an instant to look into the ghastly shrine of torment. Hell is horrible, for we may say of it, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man to conceive the horrors which God hath prepared for them that hate him. Well, Abraham replied back by pointing to the Pharisees' favorite source of authority. He told the rich man that his brothers already have the law of Moses and the words of the prophets written for them in Scripture. There they'll find all the information they need. If they listen and obey them, then it should lead them away from torment to the eternal kingdom. Now this also implies that the rich man had the same opportunities to listen and hear God's word that his brothers have, but none of them were listening. No, Father Abraham, he objected. They need more evidence than what the Bible says. If someone from the dead comes to them, then they'll believe and repent. How many of you had at one time said something similar or have heard someone say something like that? If I only had real proof that God exists, then I'll believe. But in all reality, supernatural miracles and spectacular signs cannot produce either conviction or conversion in the hearts of the lost. Think of all the miracles the Lord performed in front of the religious leaders, and yet most of them still refused to believe that He was the Messiah. In fact, if you remember, a man named Lazarus actually did come back from the dead. And according to John chapter 12, verse 10, the chief priests wanted to kill him also. 
To this day, God still displays His power through miraculous signs, but many of those who have seen them still refuse to believe in Him. Why? Because miracles don't compel a person to believe. If it did, faith wouldn't be needed and our Lord wouldn't have been crucified. As long as someone has a hard heart, no sign, miracle, wonder, or gift will persuade them to repent of their sin and seek forgiveness. The only thing that creates faith unto salvation is by hearing God's Word. Romans 10.17 says, Faith comes from what is heard. What is heard comes through the message about Christ. This was the point that Abraham was making to the rich man in the final verse of this chapter. There in verse 41, he told him, If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they, won't, they, won't be, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. You see, regardless of how extreme the miracle is, it will be ineffective to cause faith or repentance. A person must listen with ears to hear to the message of salvation found in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, Moses and the prophets pointed to Jesus as a Messiah who would bring salvation. In the New Testament, we're shown how Christ saved us. This is why I stand here and tell you what the Bible says. I believe the Word of God is the most powerful way to bring people to faith, repentance, and salvation. Those who claim there can be no effective evangelism without signs and wonders should consider what it says in John chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. Many came to him, that is Jesus, and said, John the Baptist never did a sign, but everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. If you haven't already, eventually you'll hear Satan whisper in your ear, you can't witness because you don't know enough of the Bible. You're not that solid in your walk. Your understanding of theology is too elementary. Don't listen to him. This isn't true. The most powerful thing you can share is your own testimony. After he was cornered by the Pharisees, the once blind man simply said, I can't answer all of your questions concerning the nature and person of Jesus. But the one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. And you know what? None could deny it. So too, the most powerful thing you can tell your unsaved parents or a lost friend or a neighbor is simply what the Lord has done for you. Romans chapter 10 verses 14 and 15 says, How then can they call on Him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about Him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, verse 31 also foreshadows the death and resurrection of Jesus. See, Jesus came to call sinners, not the, not the righteous, to repentance. Why? Well, as Abra Abraham states, those like the rich man and his brothers and Pharisees are so convinced of their religious superiority and their righteousness before God that they will never respond to a call to repentance, even if the authority behind it is the voice of the resurrected one, the voice of the Son of God, the voice of the second person of the Trinity, the voice of Jesus Himself. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's on this basis Jesus can explain that all of Scripture points to Him. He is the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament taught. Yet, for the rich men and for the Pharisees of the world, He was something radically new, something they'd never accept, no matter how powerful a sign God uses to prove that this 
is his son, in whom he is well pleased. So, here's the overall point and the lesson that we ought to learn. A set of values and a perspective on life that considers only the temporal, the worldly, and the present life is inadequate and will prove to be foolish in light of eternity. Let me remind you again that the rich man didn't go to Hades or, or hell because he was rich. In fact, Abraham was a wealthy man himself. Yet in this story, we find him in heaven with Lazarus. See, the rich man went there because his life and hope were devoted to his earthly riches, which he never used to lay up treasures in heaven. He put his own earthly ease before the concern for others, which indicated that his heart wasn't right with God. Now, although, yes, their lifestyles may have been different, both the rich man in this story and the religious leaders of Jesus' day did share something in common. They cared nothing for the needy around them and despised them with neglect. That's why they were so offended in chapter 15, verse 12, when they saw Jesus welcoming tax collectors and sinners who came to hear him. This story was thus a solemn warning to the Pharisees and anyone in general who would live for money, that they do so at the peril of their own souls. See, it's better to beg for bread on earth than to beg for water in Hades. If you're a born-again believer, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and He is your Lord and Savior, May this passage renew your compassion for the lost and your commitment to share what the Lord has given you. May you never forget that beyond this life is an eternal destination. And may you never forget how powerful the Word of God is and how effective your testimony can be. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray and hope that you'll always make heaven your supreme goal in life. Listen to what Jonathan Edwards said. There, in heaven, this infinite fountain of love, this eternal three-in-one, is set open without any obstacle to hinder access to it, as it flows forever. There, this glorious God is manifested and shines forth in full glory, in beams of love. And there, this glorious fountain forever flows forth in streams, yea, in rivers of love and delight, and these rivers swell, as it were, to an ocean of love in which the souls of the ransomed may bathe with the sweetest enjoyment and their hearts, as it were, be deluged with love. Now, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're not born again, I hope this message has caused you to carefully consider where you're at now and where you'll be after you die. In case you don't know or you need a reminder, let me just give you a short summary of what the Word of God says happens when a, when a person dies. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 tells us that when a believer dies, his body goes to the grave, but his soul goes to be with Christ in heaven. However, as this story indicates, when an unbeliever dies, his body also goes to the grave, but his soul awaits judgment in a place of suffering and remorse. Now, in the day of the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18 says that the bodies of, the brand new bodies of believers will be raised from the grave and be reunited with their spirits and souls and will dwell with Christ for all of eternity. We're then told in Revelation chapter 20 verses 12 and 13 that at the judgment of the great white throne, the bodies, spirits, and souls of unbelievers will also be reunited. But because they refuse to repent of their sins and accept the forgiveness 
that God offered through the death of His Son Jesus, they'll be cast into the lake of fire, a place of eternal punishment. So with this in mind, I want to share with you a question Jesus asked in Mark chapter 8, verse 36. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? See, what Jesus is saying here is that once you've spent your life, you won't be able to buy it back. So let me ask you, is there anything in this world worth having or clinging on to if it means losing the hope of being in the Lord's eternal kingdom? Now, if you're struggling to answer that question, then take into account that this world can only be enjoyed for a season. And with that, and even that, it'll be with a, a lot of fatigue and a lot of trouble. The soul, however, continues forever. And if it's lost and damned, its torment always abides and the smoke of it ascends forever. Its worm never dies, and its fire is never quenched. So don't be like the foolish rich man in this story who realized, that after, who realized after it was too late that gaining the whole world isn't worth the agony and the loneliness that he was experiencing. So use this opportunity. Use this time. Use this moment that God has given you to change the course of your eternal destination because the fact of the matter is you may not have another it says in James chapter 4 verse 14 for you are like vapor that appears for a little while then vanishes ladies and gentlemen in order to have absolute certainty that when you die you'll be in paradise with the Lord you must be saved you must be born again but that can't happen until you do the following. You must accept your sinful condition. You must repent of your sins. You must ask for forgiveness. You must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. And you must accept His free gift of forgiveness. So if you're watching and listening and that's what you want to do. You're ready to do that. You're ready to surrender your heart to Christ, to open the doors of your heart to Jesus and allow Him to be the master of your life. Then I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes, bow your head, and if you're able to, you, you can even go on your knees and with all your heart, with a sincere, honest heart, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me in my new born-again life. Pray this in your name. Amen. If you prayed that, then welcome to the Kingdom of God. Although we may not be there yet, you are now His child and you are part of the family. So let us know about it. Tell us. Write us, email us, send us a message on Facebook or YouTube. I'd love to talk to you and, and get to know your story. And I'll share mine as well. I have no problem sharing my testimony with you and how I came to the Lord. So I hope that this message has challenged you, has encouraged you, and has made you see that the life you live now matters. And the choices you make will ultimately determine where you'll end up in eternity. I'll be praying that all of you have a great week and that God will use you for His glory. I look forward to sharing another message with you next week as we uh, 
move on to Luke chapter 17. May you be blessed. Have a good one. Bye.